Glory to God. 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 I don't want anybody sitting outside. I don't want anybody sitting outside. Get yourself back inside. Amen. One of you guys, can you go get me one of the towels, please? Thank you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Forgot to bring it down this morning. Glory to God. Nobody's sitting outside. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I tell you, I, I, let me tell you something. I've been on a fast for a couple of weeks. And I tell you that God's been doing some things. Amen. We have been to the prison and we have seen people saved, people getting ready to be baptized right there on Richmond prison ground. We have seen things happen. We had Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving meal a few days ago, and just to see people coming together to worship God and to honor God for sending them from distant countries, and yet they are here in Jamaica together to honor the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Alec. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. I just want, I don't usually do this, but I, I want somebody to come and just, maybe two people this morning, to just come and give us a, a testimony. Amen? A testimony. I, I'm going to pick on one of them. I'm going to pick on this guy that just walked in the room. Amen? You better come and give me a testimony, my brother. All right, so uh, you, you, you can't come in here, man, and not give a word of encouragement. You understand me? And then I want somebody from over on this side to give a word of testimony. Amen? I don't know if it'll be Miss Shireen or Mr. Shireen in, in the back. All right, but um, you know what I'm talking about, Brother Lisa. One of you, or, or, or Miss Olivia, or, or, or Miss Chantal, you know, whoever is back there that wants to give a, a word of testimony. So come on up, uh, Ryan. Come give that word of testimony this morning. Let God be praised in the house. Amen. Give him a hand. Glory to God. Pleasant morning, everybody. Good morning. Just give God thanks for being here. Um, I think it was a songwriter that says, I woke up this morning and started looking over back my life with my heads on my pillow and tears falling from my eyes. Then I realized that I wasn't being too grateful. Instead of just saying, thank you, Lord, I keep on asking you for more. I was there this morning, I was watching, I was like, I'm not really sure if I'm going to church, but for some reason I felt led to. So I went by church and I started walking this direction because I had to see Pastor Watson afterwards. I didn't know that I would actually catch worship. But I was coming in and I heard the song that Fabian was saying, um, age to age he stands. And I was like, God, I remember where I was coming from. I remember when I was nothing because I was one of those guys that it would to say like, let me just put it this way. Um, society would have to be a reject because he was destined for no greatness, no good, no nothing at all. Family, church, friends, everybody's like, you just, I found myself like I was distant. But I'd be like that period where there was no prophets between the Old Testament to the New Testament, right there. Was that was my period of my life when I started to actually look and I started to seek God for myself. I'm not going to say that I'm perfect. Nobody's perfect. The only person who was perfect was Christ himself. And if you want somebody perfect, I don't really not think Christ out of that. But I give God thanks for who I was because my past helped me not to shape my future. And I find myself constantly being placed in situations where society, I'm not sure, maybe I was placed there for a reason, from different jobs to different meeting other people and all of that, building up my self-esteem and all of that stuff. And I find myself that my past experiences have helped me to shape others. So it's like I would tell myself every day that Pastor Watson always asked me what it means to be prophetic words. And I was like, I speak what I can do, and what I do, I say, and I mean it. And I, it's my aim, you see, that most like young people, but adults also, because I got most of my knowledge from a lot of adults and young people also being on this roadside with their friends and all of that. So I know what it's like to fit in on both sides of the life. And I try to encourage young people, you see, that the things that you do know, it's that that shapes your future. Yes. And it's always things good to seek guidance. 
Because if I had, gu had guidance when I needed it, maybe my life would have been like some big professional, rich and a driver, big vehicle and all of that. But that wasn't my destiny. I was to be brought through the situation like Jonah. So I give God thanks for who I am. Because who I am is a very, I'm not really know how to explain it, but I just give God thanks for it. Yes. And that's all just my few words. And young people, it's always good to seek help and guidance. No matter what the situation is, like family, friends, and everybody going against you, there's always one person you can talk to. You just find a car and you start talk to God about it. Intercede. Just, but if you can't talk, you cry. He always understands why. And out of that, he finds someone to send along to help you and guide you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ryan. Who over here? Come on, quick, 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 quick. Come on, brother. Kino, you wanted to come? All right. Brother Lee F. Blackford, a young minister in the house. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Lord. First, I greet God in the highest and like to greet everyone in Jesus' name. Yeah. You know, I'm, I must thank God for sparing my life, allowing me to live to see another day which he had created for us. You know, he woke me up in my right mind, gave me food to eat. He gave me journey in mercies. You know, so it's a lot to give thanks for. You know, and, you know, for from, from my personal, um, you know, testimony, you know, I just want to say that, you know, you know, you know, through all your tribulations and through all your trials, you know, just learn to trust in Jesus because he will make a way somehow, you know, because I've seen, I've seen how God has, you know, done things in my life you know that you know i i didn't even expect but you know that i'm just trying to tell you that you know just trust in god and he will make a way for you amen, amen. amen. bless you glory to god and and the last one for this morning before i come up and we receive our morning's offering is going to be this lovely lady that's sitting over here. I uh, want her to just stand and greet everybody this morning. She hails from Pembroke Pines, the Cathedral of the Messiah, Florida. Amen. And uh, and I think I know her, but um, <laughs> you know, woman of God, prophet of God, and mighty, mighty, mighty speaker. And um, she's here, my wife. Thank you, honey. <laughs> this is my better half. You might not see me all the time, but um, I love you and do care for you. <laughs> Amen. It's good to be here this morning to see you all. It, it, it's a pleasure. I'm enjoying all of you, all of your worship and everything. And I just had one word. I knew you were going to do that, and, and the Lord has spoken to my spirit. And it's about Peter and how Peter saw the Lord in water, and he wanted to walk in water. And I just want to encourage you this morning, whatever situation that you're going through, know that God is able. Just remember that Peter, by faith, came and walked on the water. But when he took his eyes off of the Lord, he began to sink. But what a lot of people have not seen, the Lord did not allow Peter to drown. You will not drown in your situation. For God is able, and God will take you through. Just keep focusing on God, and he will bring you through. It doesn't matter how the situation looks. It doesn't matter how strong the storm is. Know that God is God all by himself. And you just have to rest in him. And when you begin to rest in God, he will make the storm stop. He will say to the storm, be still and know that I am God. So be still in your situation this morning and know that your God is alive and well. May God bless you. I love you. I bring greetings from the Cathedral of the Messiah Worship Center. And someday we're going to come down here and, and, and do things with you. And I'm looking forward to that. God bless you all. I love you. Amen. Wow. She's ready to preach. Yes. Hallelujah. It is good to see all of you this morning, but it's time 
it's time for us to think about worshiping God in a little bit different way. Amen? Worshiping God in our giving. Now, I'm going to say this before I move much further. If you don't plan something, what are you going to reap? Amen? You reap what you sow is what the scripture says. If we want gunga peas, we plant some gunga peas. I don't see anybody going out in the yard and dancing around and, and, and saying, gunga peas come, hallelujah, gunga peas come. And they haven't planted a gunga peas into the ground, right? So if you are thinking of doing good things, and by the way, it's not just offering in the church, it's even in your life. If you don't plant good things with your friends, how do you think you're going to have good friends? If you don't plant good seeds in your relationships, how do you think you're going to have good relationships? Amen? Amen. Well, praise God, we're going to plant some finances today. And so if you're in need of an offering envelope, I want you to raise your hand and uh, one of our ushers will get one to you. I think our young people are ushers today. Chantilly, come, come Chantilly. Chantilly is one of our uh, kids' church. And who else? Daniel? No, I'm sorry, Nigel. Nigel is our second usher today from our kids' ministry. All right? And I really appreciate them. They are just, I was driving down the road the other day and I stopped down in the rock of Bethlehem and I heard, Pastor, Pastor, I can't get the light from you. They were coming home from school. Now, it would have been interesting if it was just the two. But when I opened the door for them to come in, all of a sudden, it's like the whole school decided to come into the car. Amen? And so I said, I can't carry everybody. But I, I tell you, everybody that tried came in. And so we had a full car coming down the road. Amen? But these are some precious young ones. And so if you raise your hand, you want an offering envelope, one of them will get one to you. If there's anybody that needs one, well, I guess nobody really needs one, so you can go back with Miss Kenesha, and uh, she will direct you further as we proceed. There is a scripture that I'd like us to look at, if you wouldn't please, in your Bible. It's Malachi, the third chapter. And I'm going to take a moment for you to see that. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, and we'll use the King James Version, please. Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, the King James Version. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God in the heavens and in the earth. Let us declare him Lord of all. Glory to God. I'm taking time to give you an opportunity to find it. Yes, I know it will be on the screen, but I also want you to know it's in your Bible. Because when you get home and you're in your bedroom, when you're on the road, you don't have a big screen in front of you to see the scripture. So I would like you to make sure that you know where it is and you know I'm not making it up. Right after this, I'm going to ask you to flip over to Luke chapter 6 and the 38th verse. So hold on to Malachi chapter 3. We are also going to be going to Luke chapter 6 verse 38, also in the King James Version of the Bible. Glory. I want us to read, many of us would think I'm going to read from the 10th verse, but this morning let us begin with the 6th verse. Let us turn to the person next to you and say this with me. The Lord Jesus never changes. He was good yesterday. He is good today. He will be good tomorrow. Say this again. The Lord Jesus never changes. He was a healer yesterday. He is a healer today. He will be a healer tomorrow. Say this with me. The Lord Jesus never changes. He loved me yesterday. He loves me today. And he will love me tomorrow. The scriptures, Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. 
Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Verse, verse, verse 8 is continuing our reading this morning. It says, Will a man rob God? Ye have robbed, yet ye have, yet ye have, yet ye have, yet ye have. I'm not a stock record, I'm just trying to emphasize something. He says, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, when or how have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings, says the Lord. Verse 9, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me. Even this whole nation, bring ye therefore all the tithes into the storehouse, and there that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I want to emphasize something in the tenth verse. It says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Your tithe is not something you give to the man in the street. Your tithe is not something you give to the grocery store and buy something for the man who doesn't have meat. You notice God says your tithe comes into the house of God. Your tithe is sown into the place that is the place that you receive your feeding. So your local church is a place you give your tithe. Now when you give offerings, your offerings certainly can go to the other things. Let's quickly go to Luke chapter 6 and the 38th verse. And I'm talking now about the blessings of God. Luke chapter 6 and we go to the 38th verse in the King James Version. It says, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you give, with all it shall be measured to you again. If you don't understand what that means, anybody ever had a bottle of Coke or a bottle of Pepsi? And you shook it up, you shake it up and shake it up and shake it up. When you shake it up, when you open it up, what happens? It just boom, goes everywhere. The scripture says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It means what? It means that when you receive the blessing, it's going to so explode, it's going to touch your neighbor, it's going to touch your, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother. The blessings of God come as you act, as you give into God's kingdom. So I appreciate this morning your giving. I appreciate your gifts. I appreciate your generosity because you see God doesn't come out of heaven and say thanks other than the blessing flowing to you and so this morning on behalf of heaven I say thank you glory to God glory to God ushers if you would get ready not yet get ready I want us I'm not going to have you stand right now I'm just going to leave you sitting because we're going to make a declaration over the offering that's in our hand we are not just throwing an offering we're not just giving an offering. We are going to make sure that we speak over our offering a good word. And so if you would look on the screen with me, we are going to be speaking this together. So have your offering in your hand. Have your offering in your hand. Have your offering if you ha in your hand. And we're going to be declaring our offering proclamation. Lord, let's say it together. Lord, as my high priest, I present to you my tithe and my offering, which is holy unto you. I am sowing it into your kingdom, willingly and cheerfully, because I love you. I am giving to fulfill the great commission. Thank you, Father, for making it possible for me to be a covenant partner with you. I give believing and expecting the favor of God and the grace to prosper to be upon my life as you have promised in your word. Amen and amen. Ushers, please receive the morning's offering.
Oh, Jesus. Well, we have a couple of really interesting things to do today, and I am introducing a message this morning. Um, surely we won't get through all of it. But I want us to know that God is a giver to us. Amen? Amen. And we know that as we give to him, that he certainly returns to us. We have a young lady here this morning that is going to be dedicated. Beautiful little girl here. And so my message is going to um, be brief. And then we get into another message, which is the message of dedication of our children in just a few minutes. But today's topic, uh, as he puts it on the screen, is this. Demolishing strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 is what we're going to be reading this morning. So let's just say a word of prayer over this word, and then we will continue with the short message, and then we will get into our, our dedication for our little one. But uh, we're going to be preaching this again, I'm sure. Yes, Lord Jesus. There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, praise God. Technology. Eh? Demolishing strongholds. Father, we thank you this morning for the word. We thank you, Lord God, for an inspiration from heaven to share and to minister this word, Lord God, to be a to be an answer, Father, to the issues and challenges of life that people, Father, experience. We praise you, we magnify you, give us simple words, but yet profound words, Lord God, to make an impact in lives and to change destinies because of what we share. This morning, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray this and we expect, Lord God, the Spirit of God to move in a great way. Amen. The topic, as I said, is demolishing strongholds. Many of us would wonder, what does he mean, stronghold? What does he mean when he's talking about something like this? What on earth is a stronghold? What on earth is something that we hear it all the time and we wonder, what, 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 why does somebody talk about stronghold? What does it really mean? Does it mean somebody grabs a hold of you and when they grab a hold of you, they, they, they won't let you go? That's a stronghold, yes. But that's not what I'm talking about today. When I talk about a stronghold, in somebody's life. Let, let, let's do this. Let's turn around to the person next to you and say this with me. Let, you look at them. Look at, look at the person and look at them with, with some kind of you know, passion, seriousness and say this. A stronghold, a stronghold. May, hold may hold you down. May stop you, may stop you. from experiencing experience. God's best God's because you may think wrong. You, you may walk wrong. You may do some things you don't want to do because Satan has a stronghold on your life. So right now, I speak into your life. Loose them and let them go. Let them be free from strongholds in Jesus' name. So what am I talking about when I say strongholds? A stronghold is an attitude. A stronghold is a behavior. A stronghold is a thought pattern. A stronghold can even be a cultural difference. A stronghold can be a tradition. I'm going to go over that again. As a matter of fact, he has it on our screen that he could have put it up, but he didn't put it up. There, there are several things that strongholds are. Number one, I said, what can be what? Attitudes. They can be behaviors. They can be thought patterns. They can be cultural differences. Or they can be traditions that we have experienced. And when we come to church, we bring our tradition. But traditions of men is not what God desires. God desires his own word to be the thing we follow. Amen? 
So let me go down the list. Let's talk a little bit this morning about the issue of a stronghold, something like an attitude. The attitude we grow up with in church, the attitude we grow up with in community, the attitude we show people around us can be something that defeats us or something that brings us into success. Somebody said, I know this over the years, they said, your attitude your attitude determines your altitude. That is, if you have a bad attitude, guess what? You're going to get fired if you don't change it. If you have a bad attitude, you get kicked out of school if you don't change it. If you have a bad attitude, there are some issues in life that you may not have the right kind of friends you need to have. Because your bad attitude tends to attract other people with bad attitudes. And then you get into situations and you're confronted with bad attitude consequences. But you may wonder sometimes, why do you have a bad attitude? A bad attitude can come because of how you were dealt with and how people treated you as a young child as you were growing up. If people always beat you and mocked you and talked about you and called your name, you, you kind of create something around you and you insulate yourself from love. You insulate yourself from, from, from dealing with people in a positive way. And so when others come around you and try to treat you well, the first thing that comes to your mind is what do they want from me now because your attitude stinks and that attitude you have grown up with that attitude and so at five years old the attitude might be cute at six years old somebody may say oh the little the little child is precocious and they you know they're, they're they're shy and they're this and it might be nice at six and seven and eight but when they get to be 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 now it gets to be rude and when they get to be 15 now it gets to be stinking and when it gets to be 20 it's devastating That's a stronghold that has been established and it doesn't come overnight. It's something that's developed in our life. When we tell people they can't, you're not my mother, so you can't say nothing to me. That's a bad attitude and it comes because we're rebellious. When we go into schools and we don't want to follow through on the disciplinary structure, we don't want to follow through on the rules. It's because of how we were raised. Because if you look around you, there are people that fall. I, I, I would dare say, I look at this lady sitting right here. And I would say that she's a rule follower. Amen? Amen. She's smiling at me like, well, some of the time. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. But you understand what I'm talking about. That we, as we have grown up in a certain generation, we learn to follow the rules. I'll give you this example. If I go into the United States right now and I'm driving down the road, people stay in their lane. In Jamaica, we have two lanes, people make four. You understand what I'm saying? We don't follow rules. But those things were taught to us as we were going. Hey, stretch it a little bit. Hey, take a little bit more. Hey, don't worry about it. If the police not watching, listen, you can go a little bit faster. If the police not watching, well, you can try to go around. If the police not watching, you can go through the gas station. If, if somebody isn't watching us, we can violate the rule. It's an attitude problem that starts very young. So the first thing on the list was what? Attitude. Then we have the issue of what? Behavior. Learned behavior. Because a lot of us, when a child comes into the earth, that child's behavior is not carved in stone. As a matter of fact, there's a term that I learned when I was in school, and it said the child came, there is a Latin term, tabula rasa. I don't want to pronounce it because you might think I'm cursing here in Jamaica. It means blank slate. And you see like Daniel right here, Daniel, come here Daniel, quick, quick, run, run, come Daniel. You see like this little guy here? When Daniel comes into the earth and Daniel begins to walk on this planet, Daniel doesn't come with a predisposition normally for some things. For example, for Daniel to start to be cursing and using some of those colorful words in Jamaica, he's got to be around people. You know you get into the supermarket or you get into the pharmacy and you hear the little boy, this little kid starting to go X, 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 X and Y, 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 Y. And the mother says, I don't know where he got it from. He got it from you. 
Mommy says, I don't know why he doesn't listen. He doesn't listen because you don't teach him how to listen. As a matter of fact, you are probably just like him. The behaviors that our children have are inherited behaviors or behaviors we teach them. And the strongholds of life when they grow up, they won't behave right when they get out of your eyesight. You wonder why children have problems in school? Because somehow they don't behave at home. And we do nothing about it. I know, don't get me wrong, there are some exceptions to that. Because there are some children that act up nice in, at home, and when they get to school, they're like the devil. And then the parents wonder, why well, they're not around me like that? There, there's a young man right here in this room. I don't know where he's hiding now because he probably knew I was going to pick on him. But, but, but when he's around me, I can't find an angel like that. And then when he gets out of my presence, my God, my God, my God. I got to intercede. I got to pray. I got to fast for him. Amen? Amen? Why? Because he is challenged out of my presence. But, but beyond that, a lot of times, uh, let me ask you this question, good people of God. Turn to the person next to you and say, are you a good person of God? And answer and say, yes I am. Yes, I am. Okay, now let's see if we can answer this question. Now, if you are a smoker and you tell your child not to smoke, guess what? They won't smoke. If you send your child to go buy ganja, and you tell them don't smoke it, but you're buying it for you to smoke it, guess what they're going to do? I know people that tell me, but I don't know why my child smokes. I said, do you smoke? Thanks, Danielle. We create strongholds in our children's lives. We create challenges in our children's lives. Hey, let, let, come, come, come here, Ricardo. Ricardo, you come, 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 quick, quick, quick. If we have a child, if we have a son, and we never take the child and say, hey, man, I love you. I care for you. You're going to do well. You're going to be strong. You're going to be courageous. If we don't do this to them, they grow up with a stronghold of weakness. Not knowing that they can do something. Not being encouraged enough to know that somebody can love them and care for them without taking advantage of them. I'm slapping you in the head, aren't I? All right, I'm not going to beat you up anymore, okay? You understand what I'm saying? Because they grow up with a weak self-esteem. They don't know that people care for them. And they don't know that people love them because we don't say it. The most thing we say is things to hurt them, things to demean them, things to put them down. We curse them. And listen, do I need to say it in the Jamaican terminology? Do I need to say it in your, in your little um, language that we use in our communities? No, I don't think so. You know what people say to the children. You know how a child is put down day to day. You know Oh, a child is dishonored. You know what we do. Even in the, thank you, Ricardo, even in the classroom, dance. Even in the classroom, we talk all these negative words so that we're not, you're not, you're not, you're not a mountain, nothing. Even in the classroom, you're idiot, or you're stupid. Even in the classroom, where we put down our kids and don't think that it's going to have an effect. It will. It creates a bondage upon them. It creates a behavior pattern upon them. And then we wonder why we have the kinds of things we have today. I'm going to talk about this more next time. But thought patterns. What we program into their lives. Most of our kids have been programmed with failure. Most of our kids have been programmed with this one thing that is devastating to every society. This one thing that has so permeated the Jamaican society and so permeated St. Mary. Because people say day after day after day after day after after day about St. Mary. We talk about it. We drink it. We eat it. We sleep it. We dream it. This one word that describes this thing that is so destructive to our children. This one thing that is so destructive to families. This one thing that is so destructive to societies. This one thing 
this one spirit that has been released into the earth that is so destructive to the psyche of a human being and the spirit is called poverty poverty of money poverty of ambition poverty where we think that we can never achieve anything because we have nothing and we will never have anything and we will never grow into anything we will never be able to do anything we will never accomplish anything poverty has destroyed the fabric of our nation you think it's only money poverty of esteem we don't believe we could ever accomplish anything only one man named Usain Bo can run and be a champion but let me tell you something people of God every single one of us has champion on the inside every single one of us has champion has potential every single one of us have if we deal with the attitude that has been put on the inside of us if you deal with the behavior patterns that's been instilled in us if you deal with the the challenges of our mind that people have said over us we can realize if we change it and clean it up we can realize champion on the inside for every single one of us not everyone will be at the Olympic Games not everyone will be in Microsoft's organization but I will tell you something many of you can be attorneys and doctors many of you can be the top of whatever you do have your own businesses have your own practices why because you you have champion written on the inside but something is hiding it it is like me right now you see you may not see the six pack but but, but six packs are there and if you move the fat you will see it so some of us have to move the fat of poverty have to move the fat of the words that have been spoken of our lives have to move the fat of low self-esteem and begin to see champion written on our chest we are champions. You see these children, as, as a matter of fact, this child that's going to be dedicated today. If she grows up and somebody tells her every day you're not going to amount to anything. If every day she's cursed, and, and by the way, your words curse your children. If there is nobody that can curse like you. There's nobody that can curse your family like you can. And every day when you open your mouth and you say to yourself and you say to your child, we not now go on. Nothing is going to be accomplished. And by the way, you live it because you feel it, you dream it, you're saturated with it. Because you look around you and you say, nothing now go on for the person next door. And you see nothing going on for the person up the street. And nothing going on for the person across the street. But I need to tell you something. It's a stronghold that has taken our minds and we need to get rid of it. Because there's greater power, there's greater ability. And you and I need to deal with these things things that have held us in bondage all of us bondage is a challenge for all of our lives it's a, it talks about cultural differences some of us will say well you know what because I live in Jamaica this is how it is the economy of Jamaica is bad so I can't do better let me tell you this my friends if you are in God's kingdom the econ of, economy of Jamaica makes no difference Amen. there are people that I know right now they got jobs uh, you know there's one lady that I know she didn't have a job and somebody I met listen to this now you gotta you gotta hear this you gotta hear this you gotta open your ears and hear this she didn't have a job I was in a hotel lobby talking to somebody one day and got introduced to them and so we just became friends and uh, you know I, and this is over a few months and they decided they asked me one day pastor you know we have a bicycle that we bought we brought down to Jamaica brand new do you think you could use it to give to one of your boys as a as an incentive for something they gave me a brand new bicycle uh, you, you, you want to tell me you want to tell me that God is not able to change poverty mindset I didn't have to pay a 
dime for that brand new bicycle. So God can bring something into your life that you don't have to pay for. You think you have to pay for everything. Yeah, listen, it, money, money, money is not everything. God can open doors of favor for you. God can bring blessings into your life outside of your ability to pay for it. Because the issue is that you don't think it can happen. You don't believe it can happen. And you have no faith for, for it to happen. So it doesn't happen. And you work and you toil wanting things to happen within your own ability. Not realizing that God's power is already available to change it. You just haven't decided to believe him. So I'm telling you about the Lamy, that I'm in the Lamy, and I'm talking to this person, and they tell me about the bicycle. And so a few months later, they call me up and they say, Pastor, we got a job for somebody in Jamaica. Do you think that you have somebody that can fill this position? Well, so said, so done. We got somebody to fill the position for them. Now, hold on. God had to bring somebody into a hotel lobby and bring me there at the same time to sit with that person, to talk, to become friends with that person, to get on Facebook. Actually, they Facebooked me the message. So God can prosper somebody's life in Jamaica by a Facebook message? Let me tell you something, my friends. However God is going to get it to you, he will get it to you if you believe. Oh, he has to open that avenue of revenue to you. He will open that avenue of revenue to you. But you got to get beyond the stronghold of this poverty mindset. You got to get beyond this stronghold. And let me tell you, it's like a vice grip. It holds on to you like a pit bull. This poverty spirit will not want to let go. It is going to hold on to you for dear life. You got to, you got to, you got to say, let me go. Release me. Because it does not want to leave you. I don't know you ever seen people that look like poverty. They smell like poverty. They talk like poverty. And it's not them. I realize something. It is something on them. And I got to help them get out of it. So I said something to somebody in my office the other day. I said, when you get around me, I don't want no poverty spirit. I'm going to help you get out of that. I'm going to take help you take off the poverty clothes. Look, come, come, come here. Come here, come here, come, come here. I remember when I first met this guy. I remember how he used to look. I remember the sour face, the, the lime sucking face that he used to have. I, true, exactly. You remember that? When he used to come to work up by you, and how he used to come on to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, attitude up to here. And look at him now. Dapper Dan. Dapper Fabian. Amen? Amen? Look, there is not one fiber of poverty on this man. Let me point something out to you. He didn't have a job. And God, I remember one day we were talking. There's something that happened about faith. And we talked about the issue of faith and believing God. It had to do with this house. And I said to him, said something to him about that. And then we were walking down the street or driving somewhere down in Ocho Rios. And he would put out some resumes and did some things and, you know, nothing was working out. And I made one statement to him. And he turned to me and he made, he said something very positive. And when he said it, as soon as he said it, the phone rang and called him into work. As soon as he opened his mouth and he made the positive statement, I mean, immediately the phone rang. I remember the day. I know he's been on the job. This, I think it was last month, November, was one year he's been on the job. And he started out on the outside. He started about, you know, just taking bags in. And he got promoted and he got promoted and he got promoted. I tell you something, God can change your life. God can make a difference in your life. But you got to get out of these strongholds. It's holding on to you. Finally, in this list, we're looking at the traditions of men. There's more to this list. There's really more discussion to it. And we can get into it a lot more. But the point is this. Next week, we'll do the traditions of men. The things we do. Just because somebody told us last year, that's how you do it. Just because somebody told us the year before, that's the way we do it. But is that in the word of God? We limit ourselves. We shut down ourselves. 
I'm going to tell you something, my friends. There are people that have been taught because of tradition, that because of who you are, you can never get a, because of the color or the dark complexion of your skin, you will never get a job in a certain environment. There are some of you that have been taught because you don't have a CXC, you will not ever get a certain kind of position. There are some of you that have been told in tradition now, listen to me now, I'm talking about church tradition, that if you don't do this or if you don't do that, if you don't go to church on a particular Wednesday or Thursday, if you don't dress a certain way, if you don't talk a certain way, God ain't going to work for you. Let me tell you something, my friend. What does the Bible say about it? You have to believe what the Bible says, not what your neighbor says. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to believe what I say if my words don't line up with the word of God. The Bible tells you that the cattle on a thousand hills are God's. Uh, and the Bible tells you that you bring yourself, you bring your, he says, render your heart and not your garment. The Bible says that, that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I'm going to share this one last thing about this one item. The Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus when you believe God. You know what some people say? I'm trying to be righteous. What did the Bible just say? Because we have taken the traditions of men, we have taken the teachings of men, and we have, we have made that to be scripture, and we have made that to be gospel. You know what? I, I lied. I'm going to give you one more scripture. I want to teach you something else today. Here's a tradition. The Bible, there's a man of God. His name was Job. And in the book of Job, there's a scripture that says, scripture in a sense, it's written in the Bible. And the scripture says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, when somebody steals our money, when our, our health is, is compromised, we say, Oh, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So then let me ask you this. How do you reconcile that with the 93rd Psalm that says, Though a thousand fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. When I see the scripture, something is wrong because God is not schizophrenic and two-minded. God, when he says something, he says he's unchangeable. So how can it say God giveth and God taketh away in one scripture? You got to understand who said it. It wasn't God. It was Job. And when Job said it, Job said to God, forgive me because I said stuff I didn't understand. And we get up in the pulpit and out of tradition we use that word uh, out of the Bible, yes. But it wasn't God's word, it was Job's word. And Job asked God to forgive him for saying it. And we use it every day and we apply it in our life. And we don't realize that it's a lie that was being spoken out of the mouth of Job. And Job said, God forgive me because I didn't know what I was saying. And now I need you to forgive me. Because the true word of God in the book of Psalms says, I am made rich like Abraham was rich. I am made righteousness like Christ was made righteousness. You've got to know for yourself and stop following tradition and begin to follow truth. My God, the strongholds. Let me tell you this. Until you get rid of some of these strongholds, you're going to go back to your drinking. The faithful becomes faithless when we hold on to these strongholds. The control and spiritual becomes carnal and out of control when we hold on to these strongholds. The obedient becomes rebellious. The strong becomes weak. And the seeing man becomes blind. The wise man becomes ignorant. And the man that walks upright becomes lame. Why? Because we hold on to these things that have no business in your life. 
Second Corinthians 10 verse 3 through 5 is our theme scripture. And we have not read it yet. We have much more to say, but I would like us to read Second Corinthians 10, chapter 3. I mean, Second Corinthians 10, chapter 10, verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Stop there for, it says what? For though we what? Walk in the flesh, we do not war after, let me, let me tell you something guys and girls. Let me tell you something boys and girls. Let me tell you something men and women. You gotta understand this. You might look at me and I don't look like I'm any strong man. You may look at me and it seems like I don't have weapons available to me. You may look at me and you may think that I'm weak, but I'm gonna tell you this. It says the weapons of my warfare. I have weapons that you have not seen. I have words in my spirit that you have not yet heard. I have something available to me to deal with the issues and the challenges that will confront me. There is no stronghold that can deal with the word of Pastor Watson's mouth when it is the word of the living God. There is no man, woman, demon. There is no principality or those four master spirits that we know of. The, 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 the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. The the spiritual wickedness in high places these they might be four master spirits but they're nothing compared to the weapons that are available to me the warfare that i can wage against the strongholds that they bring into my life are so awesome and powerful let me tell you this they can start out in the united states of america and right here in galena when i open my mouth they have to shut down their ability no matter where i am if i'm praying for somebody in Southeast Asia. I might be at an address in Galena, St. Mary, but I'm going to tell you my word is effective. My word is powerful. Why? Because though I walk in the flesh, I do not roar after the flesh. I have what I would term uh, international ballistic missiles. When I open my mouth, Heaven stands at attention. When I speak to the enemy, Satan must yield to that which I speak. Why? Because I will not allow the strongholds of the enemy to touch me and to be maintained in my life. The next verse says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is it that's holding you in bondage? What is it that's challenging your family? What is it that, that's making a, such a, a, a difference in your life and a negative impact in your life? You know what God wants you to do. You know where God wants to take you. You have dreams and visions. But you see, a dream is just a dream until it becomes a manifestation in your life. Somebody sat at a table right over here a few days ago and they were telling me they dreamed that they were going to take exams and they dreamed they were going to do that. And they dreamed they were going to do I said, you're going to dream all your, the rest of your life. And you're going to go, to go to your grave a dreamer. Because until you step out, until you begin to speak out, until you begin to do something, all it is is a dream. And dreams only go that far. They titillate your fancy. They excite you. They make you feel good. They, 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 they bring goosebumps to you. You know, I, I remember the first time, uh, forgive me, forgive me, but I remember the first time I saw a girl in school. It was in Kingston. And something on the inside went boop, 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 boop. My fancy was excited. But I didn't know how to say something to her. And so nothing came of it. My tongue got tied. I tell you this, don't let your tongue get tied when you begin to deal with the issues of life. Don't let your tongue get tied when you begin to deal with the challenges of life. Your weapons are God's word. Your weapon is prayer. Your weapon is intimacy with God and worship. And when you begin to truly deal with the issues of life with those things, people may not understand me. 
People may not know my heart. People may not understand the things, but I'm going to tell you this. When I, when I get before God, I remember the other night I was talking with him, and he keeps reminding me. Hey, yesterday, he, he, the bus, the bus, you all see the bus. I, I mean, when he, I sat in this office and I couldn't find one, and he said to me, put an ad. He said it, Winston, put an ad in the paper. Put these words in the ad and, went and do it for these two times. And you see the result of doing it. I was looking for years, several years looking for something. And not until I listened to him did it materialize. For the weapons of our warfare are not common, and the mind is gone to the pulling down of strongholds. Next, next verse. Finally, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You don't judge my ability in this war by my physical ability. You don't judge my ability to wage war because of the words that I use. I'll tell you something also. Don't judge my ability based on the degree I have or don't have. Don't judge my ability based on how I look or don't look. Don't judge my ability on my size or my age. Don't judge my ability on the school that I went to. Don't judge my ability on my geography. Don't judge my ability because of anything you see on the outside because I'm a man of God. And I'm talking about me now, but I'm talking about you too. Don't judge Karen's ability because of who you look at her and assess her to be. Don't just Chantal's ability because you look at her and you judge or assess her because of her physical appearance. Don't judge people now because there's a greater one. There's a greater God. There is somebody available to them that will make a difference in their life that you cannot change. My God, you can conquer the strongholds of your life. And I'm going to end with this scripture. We'll talk some more about it next time, as I said. You see, without conquering them, we will always be dwelling with our enemies. Without con because our enemies are, are some of these strongholds. Strongholds are not, of our, are not our friends. Strongholds will want to defeat us. This spirit, this poverty spirit, is a stronghold in lives that, are so, that is so destructive. I told you we drink it, we eat it, we sleep it, we dream it. We are totally saturated with it. There's a city, a major city of the world, way from Jesus' time till now. Before Jesus, it was around. This city, when Joshua came into the promised land, Joshua went around and defeated mountains. Caleb went and defeated mountains. They went and did all kinds of stuff and they began to take over the land. This one city was not defeated. This one city, and this is your life. This city is your life. This is the peace of God. This city that I'm going to be mentioning is the place where you need to be. This is the place you're heading into. But you see, there's, it needs to be the, the stronghold, the, the hold on your life. The city needs to be broken. And there was a man of God when he came on the scene and when God promoted him and put him in position, he said he knew that without the defeat of the city, he, he would not be successful. He knew that without the defeat of the city, this particular stronghold in this region of the world, nothing would happen. Something had to happen to the city to bring God and to bring his success into being. And you and I have got to look at ourselves and see what is it that we need to conquer. What is it that we need to break? What is it that we need to open up right now in our own life? Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, which is the next scripture that we would like to read. Last scripture for today. And I'm just going to touch on it. It says in verse 7, Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. David has recognized that he needs to take captive that which has been captivated by the enemy. David has recognized that he has a mandate from God to exercise authority in the earth. To exercise authority over the people of Zion, which is the church of God in our day and age. I, I don't know if any of you recognize the name of the city so far, but there's a city we're going to talk about. David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David, and keep going. 
on that day David said anyone who conquers the Jebusites the Jebusites had overtaken the city the Jebusites were people that, 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 were, that were vying against the people of God they had overrun this city uh, it says who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those ho 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 hang on a second lame and blind who are David's enemies stop right there let me talk about something for a moment the lame and the blind in the city you know we're, we're talking about in this case it was physically lame and blind but I'm talking about spiritual lame and blind people there are lame and blind people in our cities there are lame and blind people in our churches there are lame and blind people trying to teach us and tell us what we ought to do there are lame and blind people leading our nation there are lame and blind people leading our our communities there are lame and blind people leading our companies and we need to find out who the lame and blind is that's keeping us because these lame and blind people if you read the entire context here the lame and blind were holding the city of David captive and David had to deal with them it was a stronghold and you are listening to people that are lame you're listening to people that are blind lame and blind people are ignorant people lame and blind people don't know where to is lame and they're lame they can't walk they can't carry themselves they are blind people but we are following them they are lame and blind people but they're intimidating us they are lame and blind people but we are allowing them to confront us we are the ones that are seeing we are the ones that have authority and power but we're allowing the lame and blind to mess with us listen to this who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace of David. Keep going. David then took up residence in the fortress. By the way, this city, if you don't know it yet, is Jerusalem. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He he built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward next part and he became when he defeated when he defeated the Jebusites he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him a stronghold was brought under authority a stronghold was no governed by God a stronghold you see when cities are governed by the blind ignorance prevails folly prevails when the lame and the blind that can't see and don't know how to walk lead it means that our purposes are darkened the lame and the blind cannot give direction they are empty and they are ignorant the lame and the blind have no vision and are against the will of god when cities as i said are governed by the lame and the blind immorality prevails dishonesty prevails when a school is governed by lame and blind people when a classroom is governed by a lame and blind teacher there is a problem we have to conquer the ignorance in our nation. We have to conquer the ignorance in our communities and in our families. We have to conquer the ignorance in our very churches. Before David became great, he had to deal with the blind and the lame. You see, and I want you to put this slide up as we end this morning's message. Part one of demolishing strongholds. Strongholds are designed. Strongholds are designed to limit you. Strongholds are designed to restrict you. Strongholds are designed, design, designed to confound, that is to confuse you. Strongholds are designed to hold your sense of creativity and productivity at the ransom of Satan. Because things are holding you in bondage. You say you can't achieve anything. You don't have enough money, so it can't work. Let me tell you something. There's a man who actually dropped out of college and decided to go do work in his garage. Let me tell you about somebody in Jamaica, instead of this man in America for just a moment. This man in Jamaica, he decided he's going to start to he, wanted to, he wanted to sell a particular item. And so he went and he asked his mother, can I do it in your kitchen? So he got his mother's stove and he started to bake these little things. And he began to sell them and distribute them out of his mother's kitchen. 
And the business began to grow and expand, so he had to get a little bigger stove, I think, in his mother's house. And eventually, do you know what the name of that company is today? Juicy Patties. Start in mommy's kitchen. The boy didn't have a whole lot of money. There's another little boy out of St. Anne. He decided he wanted to go to college. Don't have a dime. His mother, they, they were poor immigrants <clears throat> from the Middle East. Okay? Well, let me talk about this other one first. This man, his family, they had a little store, a little grocery store, a little wholesale store. And he wanted to go to college, didn't have any money. So he decided, Mr. Brave Son, he going to call upon the office of the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister then was Mr. or Sir Hugh Scherer. So he goes into the, Mr. Scherer's office and said, you know what? If you will help me go to school, I will be a blessing to Jamaica. And I will come back to Jamaica after I go to school and I will do things and I will do this and I will do that. That man today is one of the three black billionaires in North America. His name is Mr. Leachin. Right down here in St. Anne. There's another little boy <clears throat> that his family were from the Middle East. Poor Lebanese people. Okay? Poor Lebanese people. This is not Jamaican now. And they decided they were going to go to live in Mexico. Of all. You ever heard of Mexico? And I don't know, you know, Mexico is not one of the most rich places around. They went to live in Mexico City and had a little store or a haberdashery or something like that. Have you ever heard? Today he's one of the billionaires of the world. This little boy. You know what he owns that was in Jamaica? Claro. He owns, he is the head of American Moville. A little poor boy came from Lebanese parents, couldn't put two cents together. And we are complaining. This is another one he dropped out of school. He dropped out of school, college, and everybody was disappointed with him. He went, he says, you know what, I'm going to try to build things in my garage. And he's building stuff that people never really thought they would ever use like that. Today his name is just about on every desk in companies across the world. You know what his name is? His first name is Michael. His last name is Dell. People laughed at him for dropping out of school. But he had a vision. This other man, he decided he wanted to do something with his life. And he went to the chairman of a company and says, there's going to be a computer on every desk. And as a matter of fact, they, they, the computers are going to have graphics and they're going to have this and they're going to have that. And I can sell it. And they laughed him to scorn and said, no, that won't work. They're only going to be big, giant machines. The name of the company then was International Business Machines, IBM. And he said, I'm going to start my own company. And he named it Microsoft. When I get into the classrooms and I talk about this, there was a man, one last one I'm going to share with you. There was a man born of the same complexion that you and I have. As a boy, he came out of a prophetic word on the African continent. And when nobody could bring, a, a bring government and administration to the African peoples, he began to coalesce, or he began to bring people together so that the king of England and his, his cabinet took notice of what was going on in Africa because of what this one man was doing. And when they actually went to visit him, they became afraid because they did not understand the gravity of this man's power and wisdom. It was somewhat similar to when the Queen of Sheba went to visit Solomon in Israel and wondered at this man and wondered at the gifts that he had. You and I know the man I'm speaking of as Shaka. A mighty man of war. 
that even today military people are studying his strategy. I can go on and go on and go on and go on about contemporary men and women that have done main, major things. Some have been recognized, some have not. But what about you? Hmm? An architect. The enemy has shut you down and tried to shut you out and because of circumstances and challenges just made you step back sometimes and wonder where you're going. Let me tell you something. You don't come sit around me, so you don't understand this stuff and you don't hear this stuff. You sit back and try to work it out yourselves and try to encourage yourself. But sometimes you need somebody to be in your corner. You need that stronghold to be broken by the power of God in your life. To tell you, say, you, you know, you need to say, say, hey, come on, you're not going to keep me in this poverty mindset. You're not going to keep me just barely getting along. You're not going to keep me, people not paying me. You're not going to keep me with these challenges. You go, I, I, I need to get out of this. I need to break out of this box because I know God can do it. And I know God destined me for greatness. And I know that this thing is holding me back. And I'm going to deal with it because without dealing with it, I'll never get ahead. And we sit around in churches and we sit around in places hearing all kind of crap. Forgive me for using that word. Hearing all kind of foolishness. And you don't realize that the power of God is here to change your life. Quit talking about the politics. It's important. Talk about it at home. Talk about it outside. Quit talking about dressing this way and dressing that way. Quit talking about the foolish things that make no sense and begin to talk about the power of God that can change your life and the power of God that can bring you into greatness, that can allow you to be the hand of God in your community. It can allow you to change your lives and transform people, transform Galena, transform your home and transform your family, transform your bank account. Why? I'm not saying transform your bank account so you can just walk around with a whole lot of money. Transform your bank account so you can be a significant influence in the lives around you. Amen? Amen. My God. God is good. 